Good evening. Welcome to the Value of the Markets shareholder webinar. Tonight we're joined by the executive team behind Touchstone Exploration. This is a slightly new event for us tonight. We're joined by the three directors who are driving Touchstone forward and who, pre-COVID-19, have had a phenomenally successful time growing the company. We're joined by Paul Bay, CEO. Paul will, as usual, will take us on a quick presentation, a short walk through the company, just giving us an overview of the success that the company has had over, over recent months. And we're also joined by COO James Shipka, who's sitting just to the back, and Scott Vidal, who's sitting to the front to the left. Paul, James, and Scott will all be available for questions. So in the bottom right hand of the screen, you can see the uh, chat window. Please feel free to ask us questions in the chat window while Paul is presenting and during the Q&A, and we'll look to get through as many of your questions as we can. We've received a number of questions in advance from shareholders, which we'll also seek to, to answer. So Paul, please, over to you. Let's start with the presentation. Thanks very much, Ben, and um, uh, good evening to everybody. You can see it's obviously not evening here. It's uh, just afternoon here, so we're in our office in Calgary, and I, I also want to welcome in any of those people that listened in to our uh, annual meeting yesterday. Um, appreciated that. and. I know there was some issues around the questions being able to be asked in the annual meeting, some technical issues, so hopefully we'll get to those today um, as we work through here. And uh, I'll be passing off questions to Scott and James, who's ever most appropriate, so please um, please fire away and we'll, we'll go from there. So let me give you a, a, a quick run through of, of where we're at, um, and, then, uh, and then we'll open it up and, and turn it over to Ben. So to start with, uh, Touchstone really, you know, the, the story continues to unfold. Uh, as, as everyone knows, we're listed in Toronto and in London. Um, our main and only asset is in Trinidad, and we are continuing to drive forward in Trinidad, and, and I'm happy to report that, you know, Trinidad's probably been one of the most um, locked out countries under this COVID-19 crisis that we're seeing, and is actually opening up much more rapidly, especially internally, uh, than other places around the world. So James will touch on that a little bit today, that, that operations are returning to normal within the country uh, uh, very much ahead of schedule compared to the rest of the world. So let me just start out and talk about our land base in, in Trinidad, which is really broken down into two areas. Um, the orange, which is the development acreage, and then the exploration acreage that you see in that gold yellow color, and then undeveloped is in the gray. I'm, I'm not gonna touch on undeveloped today. I think it's really interesting, the exploration block you see of Oratwa on the east side of the island, you know, we could, we could probably have an in-between step where that's going to be partly orange and partly, uh, partly yellow now as, as I think we're starting to set up a development program on that block as well. But um, basically on the on the southwest corner of Trinidad, on the orange block is our oil um, development program. Uh, we still have those 200 drilling locations that we've identified over there. And with current pricing, it, it doesn't make a lot of sense to wrap, ramp up that program. So what we're doing Technically, it's obviously optimizing the production that we have and continuing to build that inventory. And then when we get back to a point where, where we see the economics make sense, we've obviously got the, the cash uh, to be able to start drilling again. We'll, we'll start that program up as time progresses. But the real focus for us has been over on the Oratwa block on the east side of the island. And you can kind of see where it sits. It sits uh, in the midst of uh, a bunch of oil properties that are there, but also that little red um, piece that you see that sits just off to the southwest corner of our block is a field that was discovered around 2000 and has been on production and it's a liquid rich gas field. And that's really um, what our focus is going to be and, and has been the remainder of the year. So if I zoom in on that block, what you see in this particular picture is that same gas pool, liquid rich gas pool sitting up the front end there that's currently operated by Shell. Um, we think that it's probably going to produce somewhere near a uh, about a half a TCF of gas, 500 BCF, and 20 million barrels of liquids. Um, and you can see the yellow outline is our, our overall block. A couple of the other key features on this map is there's a red line that goes right through the middle there. Uh, that's the main gas line that's owned by the National Gas Company of Trinidad. And on that line, you'll see there's three small triangles. Those are risers where the pipe comes out of the ground and potential tie-in spots for us for success uh, on the block. And then there's a green line that goes through the middle in the opposite direction and, and crosses that red line right in the middle of our block. That's an oil line that potentially, uh, depending on where we end up with liquids volumes, we could tie into that. Um, although initially we'd be trucking in volumes out of here. So that's kind of the infrastructure for the map. 
There is also capacity in that gas plant just south of us. We are, are talking to that operator about uh, at least bringing some of our product um, down to that existing gas plant. So both, uh, back in uh, September of last year, uh, we started the exploration program uh, on the Oratwa block. And the idea here was to drill um, what we what we identified at that time as what we thought was probably the lowest risk and the uh, highest chance of success and closest to the existing infrastructure um, well, which is the coho well that you see there. And we were successful on that. We can get into some more details, but the, the well looks like it'll come on stream um, probably in October, Q4 for sure this year, somewhere between eight and 10 and eight cubic feet a day. And that'll be, uh, that'll be the start of production. We then slid over to Cascadura. And um, if you were to go back and look at our, our portfolio of presentations, you'd see this was actually a green star at one point. We were actually offsetting what we thought was a, an old oil well that had been drilled and our idea was we could come up structure and uh, hopefully we would be able to um, improve that, that, that oil prospect. And we did that. We, we came way up structure um, and encountered uh, a very thick turbidite section uh, ended up being about 800 feet. Unfortunately, we didn't get the well to total depth. We, we had to come out of the hole early and um, and basically, uh, as I say, we, we, we had to leave that well early just because we couldn't control the well. It was starting to kick at us. And then we went back and tested it. We tested two intervals in the same sand at the bottom, and I'll let James talk a little bit about that. I'm sure there'll be some questions on, on Cascadura. And then um, the next thing we're starting to do is move into Chinook. And as I mentioned, Trinidad's opened up a little bit. We were actually unloading pipe uh, for the drilling program in the Cascadera and Chinook locations this morning. I got those videos, so that was that was good to see. Um, that's the first kickoff of the program. I, I would also note that that star was also green, you know, probably four months ago. Um, but we think with the information that we have at Cascadera now, that that's likely a liquids-rich gas play as well in, in what we see it and hopefully spud that in July. We'll be drilling through July. We should have results, I would hope, by the end of August on that. Then we were going to slide over to Royston, which was, you know, a very, very exciting prospect, probably the highest risk and the biggest uh, reward, although Cascadera surprised us, I think, in, in being much larger than we thought to about. But as a result of COVID uh, putting us back, probably in the order of three months on road construction into Royston, we're now heading into the wet season. It's more likely that following Chinook, subject to it coming in on, on cost and cash kind of staying where we're at, we go back up to Cascadera and drill a, uh, uh, another well at Cascadera and hopefully get to that depth that we originally wanted to on the first well. So that's the program we've got lined up. I'll, uh, I'll take questions. I'm sure there's going to be a bunch more detail on that as we move forward. But that's basically what, uh, what our plan is for the remainder of this year will be to get, get uh, initially one well, make sure we We've got the liquidity we need to drill the second well and go forward from them. So uh, I guess I've kind of outlined that in our in our goals here. Number one is to get Coho on production. Uh, we've awarded that contract, and James can give us details about that. Uh, we want to drill and, and and evaluate at least one, but but right now, you know, with the cash and where we're sitting right now, we, we think we can get two of those done, subject to the first one being on budget. Um, and then we want to formulate a design for getting Cascadura tied in. And, and part of that design, quite frankly, is if we have success in Chinook, and um, we, we would probably tie those wells in together. And then the last one is to negotiate the final natural gas contract with NGC. And I'm sure I'll get a question on that, so I'll leave that be. So Ben, I think I'll kind of leave it there and, um, and turn it over to you for questions. And probably you can point us in a direction that we think might be of interest for shareholders. Okay, Paul. Well, look, thank you very much for that. Um, very interesting. I mean, a huge amount going on. And it's obviously very encouraging to hear that the company's plans haven't been too negatively disrupted after um, all of what we've seen with COVID-19 over, over recent months. So why don't we start talking a bit about Cascadura? Um, obviously, you've had um, the, you know, the fantastic results there with the first well. And as you just um, told us, the plan now is to drill a second well there a bit later on this year. Now, one of the questions that's been um, asked to us by Paul, um, Paul's asked, is the original Cascadura depth, I think he means, at 10,000 feet still real? So is that still the target? Is that what you're aiming for, to get down to that, to that depth? Why don't I let James uh, take that one? 
Ben, it is. Um, the way that we look at this now is we actually see two deep prospects of Cascadura. And, and Paul will refer to this as a second well of Cascadura. You'll probably see it be named Cascadura Deep or Cascadura East because we are targeting those new horizons that are deeper. Uh, the deepest we'd like to go there is 9,500 feet is where we see the, the, the lowermost sand body. But we also see the original target we had at Cascadura 1 comes in about 8,300 feet. So we actually expect to, to try and hit both of those targets. Excellent, James. So look, I'll, I'll direct this uh, follow-up question to you. This was submitted in advance. Um, in terms of what you learned on the way down in, with Cascadura 1, um, what, what, um, what, are, what other information did you gather from that well that's going to help guide any drilling decisions uh, for Cascadura 2? Gosh, we, we learned a heck of a lot drilling, uh, drilling CAS 1, I'll be honest. Um, biggest things that we're changing here for this next well, uh, we have much better control over our, our tops and our depths, so we, we really know what should be coming at us with the second well. Uh, we have changed our strategy for running casing, just to give us a little bit of a higher safety margin. As Paul alluded to, when we stopped drilling CAS 1, it was because we were at a point where we weren't comfortable continuing safely, and safety is first and foremost in all of our operations. So the new casing design will give us a little bit better pressure flexibility, and we're also moving to an oil-based mud system, which will get us better lubrication and well control going down. And we're modifying the existing rig to utilize what's called a top drive, which will again give us a little bit more flexibility in how we drill the well. So lots of operational changes with respect to how we're going to approach it, but also we're much more knowledgeable about that reservoir now. Right. And so Ben, just, ben uh, on that note too. It's part of part of the reason why we're maybe delayed a little bit further is we obviously are uh, doing some rate modifications here. Some of those actually have to be done on site, so um, so that's just why you know another reason why things have been pushed out here. But I think it'll save us time certainly on the first two wells that we're going to drill here once we're once we've got a rate done. So so to break it down into fairly simple terms. Um, the sort of the, the unexpected um, events that you encountered as you went as you drilled Cascadura One, you've obviously learned from from those to prepare a more, I suppose, substantial well at Cascadura Two, which will enable you to get down to that that deeper target. Yeah, that's that's ex exactly right. Yeah. Pretty much characterizes it. So uh, we've got a question here from a uh, Twitter user um, who's asked: uh, Is the pay zone at Cascadura is that in the Gross Morn Formation? No, it's not. It's in the, uh, the Herrera Formation, specifically the, the 7 BC. So it, it's a very common and actually prolific reservoir onshore. Uh, it goes through uh, the Pinal Barracor area where it's primarily a gas or an oil bearing sand. Uh, however, the Carapel Ridge, the, the red blob on the map that, uh, that Paul's got up there now, that also produces from the Herrera Formation. So. It's an extension of that, and that really represents the primary target for all of our locations now on the Oratoire block. And ben, I think that's really important. Like, you know, although we found, um, you know, we obviously found a, a new pool, both at Coho and Cascadura, you know, they are, are pools, but they're both in the Herrera Formation, which is the same as the Carabell Ridge uh, pool that's been on production for 17 or 18 years. So, you know, we, we have something analogous when we're looking at you know, how these wells should produce. Like we, we actually have something that's you know that's got some pretty good uh, pretty good production history. You know, to give you an idea that that field's still producing out uh, of four wells, uh, majority of is out of two, and it's still doing roughly 45 million cubic feet a day, you know, 17, 18 years after it's come on production. So it kind of gives you a, a good magnitude of what we're talking about here as far as size and, and longevity. So um, we've, we've had a question from, from David, and I think this is just to, to clarify a point. So the new, the new well at Cascadura, uh, will that be an independent well, or are you going to re-enter the first well? It will be an independent well. It is a standalone exploration prospect uh, that we've actually designed to, uh, uh, if anything, step out a little bit further from uh, Cascadura 1 than anticipated. So it is going to be a standalone exploration well, and I would really urge everyone to keep that in mind as we drill it. But Ben, from an environmental point of view, we're using the existing uh, drilling location, like the drilling pad. So the wellhead, I don't know, would probably be 30, meter, 30 feet? Yeah, about between 30 and 50 would go feet yeah. um, from the existing wellhead at Cascadura. So, you know, from an environmental point of view, you know, we're not, we're not clearing more jungle. And actually, this was the original well from the 1950s. So it's pretty good from that point of view. But the other part is, you know, if we have 
two wells on a well site that are successful, um, once you start putting surface equipment on, you know, you really you really minimize cost and footprint and timing to tie things in. And so, you know, that's our plan. And the, and the way the team, um, when we set these drilling locations up initially, we actually apply for multiple wells on each location. Okay, so I think the Cascadero one has three, five. It's got five on it for the original CEC application. Should up will constitute one of those five. Yeah. So, you know, we've got pretty good flexibility. The plan all the way along here was that if you were successful, it's going to take multiple wells. And these pools are too big to drain from one well, right? So you're going to need multiple wells in. So does that, um, so you talked about applying for permits to, to drill multiple wells at, um, at your different sites. Chinook will be one of the wells at Ca at the, of the five at Cascadura. Um, but if we just jump back to Coho, um, does, that, does that mean we can expect to see more drilling at Coho? I think you gotta, we'll put Coho on screen, let it produce for a little while, um, see, what we, uh, see what we have. But yes, you know, our independent engineers think there's another location to drill there within the engineering report. And then quite frankly, there's, um, there's some really interesting exploration uh, opportunities at Coho that we saw in the first well that with the 3D that we've got there, I think down the road, you know, there's definitely some independent structures that need to be tested that Coho area. And as we get more confident uh, in the model, I think you'd see us doing that. So it's going to be a combination of both. Excellent. Well, um, before I come on to um, Chinook, I'll just uh, come back to Cascadora for a moment. So we've got a, a final question on Cascadura from Rafiq, who's asked us, now that the pressure recorders have been removed from Cascadura, is there any new information about the size of the pool? You alluded to this slightly earlier, Paul. Do we have any new information about what might be down there? Yeah, I'm going to I'm going to turn it over to James and, and let him probably give you a little more detail on, on what's going on there. I know I had promised... Uh, some information on those reporters by the end of uh, end of May, and uh, I'll, I'll let James take the heat why we're not quite there yet on that. Uh, but I'm going to turn it over to you. Uh, to make kind of a, a long story a little bit long for everybody, uh, when, when you run pressure recorders, when we run pressure recorders, we usually run two recorders, and that's just because you have one shot at getting data, you don't want to lose any data. Uh, so we run our two recorders when we shut the well back in, and uh, in March. The anticipation was we were going to let them run for about four weeks then recover them, but with the COVID-19 situation, uh, it simply wasn't a scenario where we could actually get them. So when we retrieved the recorders on the 13th of last month, uh, much more in dismay, we found that the high pressure and condensate in these wells had actually damaged both of the recorders. Uh, we had very good data on one recorder, and we had one recorder where the uh, the battery had actually failed and we weren't able to recover anything until yesterday. So what we had done is we had sent that recorder back to its manufacturer here in Canada who actually replaced the battery, put a new one in its place, uh, and was able to actually recover the entire section of data that we've been hoping for. Uh, and what's important about that is we actually got an additional four weeks of information off that recorder. And when we're looking at this pressure data, what we're doing is we're looking at the change of pressure over time. So the more time we have, the better model we can put together and the better detail we can give. So this has really kind of opened things up. It's actually not going to delay us much further than our expectation. Uh, my hope is that we'll be able to put something out in the public realm next week with respect to the pressure and initial interpretation of that. And then what you'll see with respect to the actual size and value of Cascadero will probably be the first week of July when we'll do a mid-year reserves update as a standalone report for Cascadero. I'll get into a little bit more detail. But I think news flow-wise on Cascadero and the data we get from it, hopefully you'll see something early to middle of next week and then first week of July. And Ben, and just to, uh, you know, from a capital markets expectation here and, and to manage this, um, what the data, you know, we've got to be really clear here. What the data is going to tell us is it, it, it won't necessarily tell us how much gas is there. What the data will tell us is how much gas we took out on the test, if there's difference in pressures. Um, more importantly, it'll tell us what the absolute open flow will be on these wells. And from that, the team can then look at what the drawdown is on the well and then determine what they think the initial IP production rates will be. So. The first stage of this um, announcement that James is talking about next week is really going to be able to confirm what the AOFs are, 
uh, the two different tests we did in the, in the same sand, uh, what we think the well will come on at initial rate wise, we should be able to get that. Able to see boundaries. And then we'll also be able to tell us whether we saw boundaries or not. And, and with that boundary information, you can then start to draw some circles to see how big the tanks are, which is what GLJ will be doing between now and July when they come back and we'll be, you know, the size of the pool of the reservoir. So I just don't want to get people expecting that they're going to, you know, they're going to see a full blown reserve report on the initial results. Um, that's really going to come out in July. And we, we, you know, our view on these is we would really like to get these independently verified. That's why we're taking a little bit longer and going to come out with the GLJ numbers um, as opposed to giving our internal estimates. We just think that from a credibility point of view and from you know, we, we really don't want people to get disappointed when they hear an internal number from us and then, you know, at the end of the year, Scott gives us help because the number's different, you know, from GLJ. I think we're better off to get everybody on the same page up front. So uh, just a little bit of patience from everybody, and, and I just want to manage those expectations. No, oh, excellent. No, well, thank you for explaining that. So. Um, I mean, of course, with with the backdrop of, of COVID nineteen, that you know, I think that the, the market does un certainly under, seem to understand the need for, for patience. And if you look at how the company's share price has performed, you know, certainly compared to pretty much everyone else in the market, I think that you know it does seem there's quite a lot of goodwill out there among shareholders, and you know, people are just ready to wait for the results to come in when they're ready, you know, without you know, sort of rushing to panic in the event that you know there might be some slight delay. Um, so look, we've been asked a number of questions talking about COVID-19, about how the company has um, has coped with um, all the disruption over recent months. Um, and I've got one question here from Angela, which is an ESG question, um, an interesting one. How has uh, Touchstone helped its local communities in Trinidad throughout COVID? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, you know, the COVID's kind of compounded for us because it, it's also resulted in very low oil prices, right? So, you know, it, it you know, we mm -hmm. talked about COVID in the industry, but it, it also, you know, I think we got $18 uh, for our oil in April. And um, so, you, you know, that's pretty, pretty, pretty dismal in, in, in our part of the world, especially when we're counting on that, that various uh, production to, to keep us cash flow sort of positive while we were moving forward. And I'll let Scott touch on that. But, um, and we did a couple of things on that that we can talk about. But as far as what we did for the community, um, We've actually kept it pretty low key on this, but uh, to date we've worked with um, the MPs in our local area, Fiza Bad, Table Land, and Rio Claro, and we identified 270 families um, that were either not eligible for subsidies or were on the roll, and we've delivered food hampers to those uh, individuals. We've actually supplied um, some direct cash as well for a number of uh, organizations and, and let them distribute it. You know, our view on this was it wasn't really a time for us to um, take a real public role in it. Um, our view was this was just a time to do the right thing and, and get the direct need to the people that we wanted to get it to. So we worked with the local government organizations. And that's probably sure. the most direct thing that we've, that we've done. Excellent. Well, that is all very good to hear. And um, yeah, certainly in keeping with the, the company's, um, you know, um, desire to, to be an active participant and supporter of the local communities in, in Trinidad. Uh, but from a business point of view, um, particularly from um, from a sales point of view, um, we've had a, a question of, uh, from a Twitter user who's asked us, how much oil storage um, does uh, uh, Touchstone currently have left, and are you a seller of oil at current prices? This is obviously in the context of the, 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 the recent drops. Yeah, so uh, bottom line is we've, um, we, we, we stored as much oil as we could through May. Um, and we've kind of got two entities in Trinidad. So where the fee, um, where we had fee simple lands that are, we're not a partner with Heritage, we actually had enough storage to get us through till this week, I guess. Can, and we started to sell at current prices into the market. Um, and then on the other lands where we're a partner with Heritage, we kind of deal with them where we were using their storage. And basically what we did is they stored it for us and we're splitting the upside 50-50, roughly. Um, and we gave them notice today to start selling any of the group that was in storage. So they'll start to store um, as we go forward. So we'll have it out by the end of the, the month. You know, it's going to make May look terrible on our monthly statements, but um, it should all come into line by the end of June. By the end of June? Yeah, by the end of the quarter. So I don't think people, when they look at it quarter over quarter, will notice it very much. We just did it internally. 
Right, and again, so in terms of how um, other operations have been affected across the island by, by COVID-19, we've had a number of questions um, along, you know, in general terms, asking broadly the same thing. How, how have your existing, other existing operations been affected by, by lockdown in Trinidad? Well, you know, we had the work at home order, which is the same thing that we had in Canada. So we, you know, we had that on our, our deal. People um, did a tremendous job. They were designated essential workers. So, um, you know, we put in place all the necessary precautions for them, cutting down the number of people in vehicles, making sure they were doing it in shifts. Um, but as I say, the country's pretty much open back up. I think next week we'll be almost full time back in the, the office. But, you know, as I said before, in, 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 um, uh, you know, the other side of this COVID was really the oil price going eighteen dollars a barrel, and so we took other pretty dramatic actions. You know, the, as opposed to laying off people, uh, what we decided to do was basically a twenty percent across the board salary cut for everybody, uh, top to bottom, including management directors. Everybody took that. Um, some of the lower paid uh, employees, we we didn't quite take that big a cut from. But basically, um, our view was we want to keep everybody around, but we need to recognize that during these prices that we make those changes. Now that we're back up and operational again, uh, you know, we're doing temperature checks, we're doing all of those great things at the, at the compound. But Trinidad has been very, very fortunate um, in the way they've done it. I mean, up till a couple days ago, they had that new case in 36 days. So they've been in pretty good shape. Biggest challenge for us is gonna to be to get some of our expats back in the country for the drilling program. Um, however, if that doesn't happen in time for the spudding, it won't hold it up. We'll just go with local talent that we've used before um, to, to do that program. So I hope that answers that question. Yeah, it does. Thank you. Well, I mean, that also brings us um, nicely um, into the the drill program. We've obviously had a lot of questions about um, Chinook, so let, let's uh, let's focus on that a bit now. So I'll, I'll summarise a number of questions in in a in a joint a double question. So first of all, um, just remind us, please, when are you expecting to um, to spud Chinook, and what are you hoping to see there? Let's say the first week of July. I think that's probably reasonable. We're going to be drilling during the month of July. Something. I would think the second week, but yeah. So let's say we're drilling in July. Let's let's be pretty broad on that. But I think you know, as I say, we got to put the top drive in, and we're putting in a different mud system. So it's we're heading into rainy season. So give us a break. It's going to be sometime in July that we do that. And uh, what we're hoping to see is, you know, I, I don't think it looks different than what we originally looked at. We're drilling the well, So our goal is to get to ninety eight hundred feet. Um, primary pay targets except. Extremely similar to what we were going for in Cascadera, somewhere in the neighborhood of 65 to 7,500 feet. The offset logs that we're, we're going off of are saying between 1,200 and 1,600 feet of sand, of which we're expecting uh, 25 to 50 percent of that to actually be hydrocarbon bearings. So uh, a couple hundred to, to maybe 500 feet of, of hydrocarbon pay there. As Paul alluded to, initially we were considering this to be a, an oil target. Uh, now it's maybe a little bit ambiguous. It could be a, a liquids rich gas or it could be a very gassy light oil. Uh, the two are really just a matter of semantics and percentages. So uh, the nice thing is we're along the same road as, as the road to get to Cascadera. So whatever we discover at Chinook, should we be fortunate enough to have a discovery there, is really just a very short infrastructure tie in back to the Cascadera location, which would be our main hub for. Uh, for distributing either oil or, or hydrocarbon. Again, we're on the 3D, so we're looking at, uh, you know, we're looking to move it up structure. We think we can optimize uh, from where we are, and, and uh, you know, we're, we think we're riding that turbidite fairway, that main sort of regional turbidite fairway. About 300 feet higher than the offset miles, so yep. it, it gets very encouraging. You know, size-wise, looks, you know, very extent, very similar, a little bit larger than the Cascadero question when we come down to the thickness. Understood. So, James, um, just to ask you then, um, given the similarities between what, what you just described for Chinook and Cascadura One, um, can we expect roughly a similar sort of uh, time frame for, for drilling operations from the point of view from the point of spud through to hitting target depth? I'm hoping it will actually be a couple of weeks shorter than Cascadura took. Cascadura, we did have some issues operationally, like the side tracks that added uh, uh, probably a week to ten days. Uh, various other mucking around with the well that, that really was unacceptable uh, to us, hence the improvements to the new well with the top drive and the mud system. So right now we're looking about 35 days spud to total depth. Uh, 
you know, that's probably plus or minus a couple of days here and there. So it should be shorter. It should be about four weeks to five weeks. Four weeks to five weeks. So we've had um, a question then, and then beyond um, Chinook, we obviously know that you're going back to Cascadura rather than to Royston. Um, Royston uh, is going to be happening next year. Does the does the company have any plans for um, taking a, a rig on a long term lease, or even perhaps buying its own? Uh, one shareholder's asked us that question. Uh, the second part of that question is real easy, and it's a no. We're not going to buy our own rig. That's just not a business we are in. Um, mm-hmm. But clearly. Uh, Clearly, if we have success at Chinook, I think what it's going to prove up is that uh, we didn't just get lucky at Casper and Coco. We actually have maybe unlocked um, a little bit of the the opportunity in the Herrera in Southern Trinidad. And in that particular case, um, you know, we've already had discussions. It does make some sense to look at uh, second rate, whether that's a rate that's on the island already or bringing in one that's maybe a little more current in technology. But we would certainly be in a position that we could afford that. And the ideal situation would be to bring in a rig that could drill, you know, up to fourteen thousand feet um, on one of the deep prospects we see. But at the same time, we could also use it for the development drilling on the west side of the island um, for some of these oil wells when we get back in the field there. And um, you know, I think like a telescopic double or something like that would be would be ideal. So we're we're probably further down that road than I'm leading on. Um, you know, one of the challenges is just you have to, you know, you've got to get it in, you've got to get it inspected, you've got to get it through the port, you've got to get it certified, you've got to do all those kind of things. So, you know, we're going to be using local content for a while. That said, the local content we've been using has been our drilling partner for about nine years now, almost. Yeah. Yeah. And we do see a scenario where we would be continuing to utilize them, you know, well as where it's applicable. So I, I think there's a little bit of both to that component. Yeah. I think you're right. A, a rate that would come in would be supplemental yeah. as opposed to. Yeah, that's a good point. Supplemental, right? Okay, so we'll we'll move on to Coho in a minute. But before we do, we've been asked um, an interesting question by Chris, um, who's asked us, uh, "What is the area of the field at Cascadura compared to Carapal Ridge?" I think I've pronounced that correctly. You're going to have to wait about a month before we can we can really delve into that. Okay, moving on. Okay, so uh, just very quickly then from David, um, you mentioned earlier, Paul, about your expats coming um, into the UK. So uh, when does um, Trinidad open up to flights for your expats to return, do you think? We don't know that. Bottom line is uh, anything I'd be giving you would be rumor. We, we don't know, so uh, we'll get them in as soon as we can get them in. In the meantime, our plan A will be to use local content until they Okay. Right. Well, let's um, let's switch our attention over to the west end of the map that we're looking at now on the Ottawa block and uh, Coho, which, of course, was your um, first big discovery last year. Um, tell us uh, now, obviously, in light of the, the, the disruption there's been as a result of COVID-19, what are your plans now? When do you anticipate the first uh, tie-ins will start at Coho? And, and when, will you, when do you hope to start selling gas? So we actually awarded that contract. We went through it. You know, the one nice thing about the Everybody still working from home. We were able to go through the whole bid process, and I think we had eight bids originally, and they were down to three or four. And, and we've actually uh, picked a local contractor who who has a great reputation on the island, and, and it's also local, which is fantastic for us. So um, you know they'll be commencing here probably in the next 30, 45 days. We've got a couple more permits we still need to get from the government. And uh, we said all always from day one, that's the variable that's going to be the biggest concern to us. The government office has been closed. They're now open again. So we'll be, uh, we'll be pushing those permits through as quickly as we can. And in talking to Brian, who's heading up our team uh, on that, um, we're hoping to have gas out there in October. October. So we've um, we've had quite a few questions about the uh, the deal that you recently announced, or the the agreement, I should say, with um, with NGC. Um, David Butler has actually summarised quite a few of the questions quite succinctly. Um, so I'll just read out what he's asked. He said, uh, "When do you anticipate getting the agreement with NGC finalised?" And will NGC pay the cost of the coho pipeline? So I think what David's really asking for is, is could you perhaps give us just a summary of the of the, the heads of terms that you have with um, NGC and, and just explain a bit about the significance of that for the company? Yeah, I, I got to be a little careful. We're in the middle of those negotiations, so I don't want to I don't want to compromise where we're at. But the, the framework agreement is pretty pretty simple in that basically what NGC wants to do is buy all the gas that we're going to that we're going to uh, find in on the Orange block 
you know, now and into the future. Um, they, they will buy all the gas, and under that arrangement, they'll, they'll build a 88 infrastructure at the edge of our leases um, to do that. We do, within that framework agreement, we did break coho out separately, just because we didn't want to get, you know, hung up on that. So we're, we're continuing to push forward with coho on our own. They will still be, likely be the buyer of the gas um, that comes from coho. In there, there is a provision where we can talk about them buying the pipeline back. I think it would probably make sense, but we're not, you know, we're not there yet. I, I think the key thing, um, as far as timing goes, this is probably the most important contract that we've entered into since we've been in Trinidad. Um, I'll interrupt and say it, it is. It is, <laughs> yeah. Um, and, uh, you know, so um, we're going to take our time to do this right. We've got some really good counsel on it. We've got some good advisors on it. We are exchanging documents. We're having a very, you know, healthy discussion with NGC uh, on the agreement, and, and we'll work that out um, as best as we can. I, I just... I know I'm sounding pretty vague on this. I just don't want to get upside of the NBA and talk about NGC. They're going to be our partner for the next 25 years, so I don't want to piss them off on the front end. No, of course. And I think well, we've, we've had, um, obviously, quite a few questions around that. And I think what you've just described is, is, is very reasonable, that shareholders will just simply have to wait. You know, when the company's been through the process of negotiation and has secured the deal, then obviously at that point you'll be able to share fuller details. I mean, perhaps, Paul, what we could even do is have you back for a webinar and at that point you could then answer shareholder questions once once these, these details can go in the public domain. Yeah, Ben, I think, you know, there'll be a very fulsome press release uh, around once we sign this off, like, the, you know, pricing, delivery points, deductions, you know, all that kind of thing that'll help Scott build the exact model of, um, of what's there. I mean, we know publicly what other companies are, what some other companies are getting for the gas on the island. So we, we kind of know where gold posts are and things like that. But I, I want to be really careful that, um, you know, we respect the, uh, the current agreement that we've got with NGC. Yeah, and just to add that, we really don't have gas sitting there ready for sale behind type. So it's in our best interest to, uh, to get this right. Absolutely. And like you say, it's a, an agreement that will you know, last for the next 25 years and take the company forward. So uh, that, that's yeah, completely understandable. Okay, well, let, let's talk a bit about the, the medium to long term. Um, we've got a question from uh, Rafiq who said, um, if we look at this map here, we can obviously see Coho, Cascadora, Chinook, Royston, but to the east, obviously, there are no prospects that have yet been identified. Beyond the four um, target areas that you already have, are there any additional areas that are of interest to you on the Ottawa block that you know might might be drilling targets? Can we just say yes? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yes, and, well, yes, I'm moving on. No, no, no. I'll, I'll let James elaborate a little bit. Um, you know, what I will say is that there is a big fault that runs through. Can you see my arrow on there, Ben? Uh, no. Okay. So, there's those two big green oil pools that are just off of our blocks on the east side, one's to the south and one's to the north. Um, the last, the last big, are in the bed. Yeah, and, and basically there's a big north-south fault that runs through the middle of there, Cedar, Cedar, Grove. Cedar Grove Fault. So it does make some of that, some of the block uh, to the east of that Cedar Grove Fault really is a different geological model. Um, so there is part that isn't going to be you know, in the Herrera fold, but I'll let James talk about the regional side of it. Yeah. One of the nice things, as Paul alluded to, when we initially set out with these four locations, they were based on wells that had been drilled in the 50s and 60s, as in the case of Coho in the year 2000. So we kind of had a reference point for where we had our highest level of confidence with the success that we've now seen with, with Cascadere and Coho. And we actually have a, a lot of 3D seismic and a fairly good inventory of 2D seismic over the block. The teams really had the opportunity over this last four months to go back through that data. And as of right now, you know, just uh, trying to be a little bit vague, as, as Paul kind of joked about, we've probably got between 17 and 20 prospective locations separate from the four that you see there on the map now. Uh, all of them are unique. All of them have probably increasing levels of risk and, and in some cases uh, are really exciting in terms of depth and opportunity. Uh, which is why when we get back to talking about needing another rig, we really can't see a scenario here once uh, once we get some of these other wells on production and have that consistent cash flow. There's probably a four or five year inventory of locations, exploration locations on this block, each of which have the opportunity to actually turn into their own fields for future development. Yeah, and I, I think, guess you so. know, go ahead, Ben. 
So I was going to say, and I, I guess that, that that development is also dependent on putting um, the infrastructure in place, because I believe from previous conversations we've had, Paul, that the further east you get, for example, the road access, there is well, there isn't any road access, hence why you're building the road to Royston at the moment. You know, there's there's a there's a degree of the development that you need to do before you can get access to these areas. Yeah, the nice thing is, though, once we build that million dollar road into Royston, you know, we've got two or three other locations that would be along that road. Um, that we can drill well, one for sure. Well, we're like five. But yeah. Okay. <laughs> Along that road, we can access as we go. Um, so you know, once you get that infrastructure, you're right. You get in place. But you know, what we really need to do here, and I, I really want to stress this, is you know, uh, we need to prove up this concept a little further. And, and you know, Chinook and Rice are definitely um, exploration targets. As is Cascadeur Deep, really. Um, so you know, I think as we develop this a little bit more, we'll get more confidence to start to step out. But but it's, um, you can see there's lots of hydrocarbon in this area. You look at Caracol Ridge, you look at Coho now, you look at Cascadura, Lata East, the Bet, um, you know, Cats Hill to the south. This is a hydrocarbon charged area. It's one of the things we love about Trinidad, right? I mean, it's, it's uh, you know, it's, it's infrastructures in place, there's lots of hydrocarbon there. Um, and we actually have decent seismic coverage over here already. Scott always reminds us of this. We still do have a seismic obligation under the license um, that at some point we are going to have to do. And, and normally you would do the seismic as an exploration tool to identify your locations. And what we're thinking now is we would probably use it as a development tool. And, uh, you know, for successful, let's say, at Royston or at Chinook, um, it might make more sense to shoot some big regional lines and tie those things together. And uh, and follow up on them so we can you know further define the size of those structures. So at some point you will see us spend uh, you know probably somewhere between two and four million bucks up here for seismic um, to identify these locations. Right. So um, you also I, I believe that there are there are previous drill results as well, and there's data from that that's um, helping feed your model. So Patrick asked us a question um, on Chinook specifically. He asked if you could talk a little about the uh, chance of strike of the prospect. In the context of the 1959 drill results, you know, with respect to risk, when we look at it, it's still probably about a 32 or 35 percent chance of success. The biggest challenge here throughout Oratoa is the structure, and a byproduct of that, as Paul alluded to, with the Cedar Grove fault, there are a number of faults that run through this block, and whether they're sealing or not sealing, or whether they've moved reservoir around or not, is, is really the one thing that's difficult to ascertain before you drill it. So even though we do have those historical logs, which had indications of hydrocarbons, and, and frankly are really encouraging in the context of what we see in Coho and Cascadura, uh, there still is that risk that we don't have a seal or that, that things may have migrated out of it. So uh, long story short, we will tend to project on the conservative, both with respect to our uh, chances of success and our production rates until we can actually prove each individual prospect. You know, Ben, um, we've talked about this before, but there's actually 70 wells that have been drilled on that Oracle block, historical wells. And um, the nice part, that's going to sound kind of strange, the nice part is we know what a wet well looks like. Yeah, we know what bad looks like. We know what bad mm -hmm. looks like. Uh, so, and we know where there's some big saddles, we know where there's some big lows up here. So, um, you know, it's Real good combination here of geophysics and, and cold log data and, and what we've got. There's, there's quite, a, quite a few tools up here. So. Right, so I'm conscious um, that, that, that time is, is running out slightly. I know that you guys have um, a meeting you have to go to. So um, we have a, a couple more questions um, that I'll ask. So um, we've just received a question from Mike who would like to know, uh, well, I'll ask you, if you could compare the known production at Coho and Cascadura 1 with known production um, on any other wells um, in Trinidad, which aren't owned by Touchstone. How, how do Cascadura, um, and Co Cascadura 1 and Coho compare to, to other producing areas of the, uh, of the island? The, the only comparables are Caracal Ridge. That, that's the only comparables of Herrera, liquids rich gas wells or dry gas wells on the island. That's, that's the only ones. And so if you look at that, uh, that Caracal or Central Block or uh, Blatta, whatever you want to name it, goes by. Those are those are the comparables. And um, as I say, you know, we've got 17, 18 years of production history, so um, you know, we we think that's pretty pretty decent production history. And I think if you look at the public data back from when those wells were discovered and first put on production, 
On the high side, the two big wells, uh, Carafel Ridge 1 and 2, both came on production between 40 and 50, 55 million a day. The two smaller wells at, at Brack and Bracket East came on in the neighborhood of, of 10 to 15. So that's kind of the, the starting point that seems consistent with what we're seeing. You know, if you were to compare it volume wise to our, our development wells on the oil side, uh, Coho being the smallest. IP we're looking at now with that 8 to 10 million is four or five times bigger than some of our best wells on the development side. Right. Ben, yeah, can we, sure, ben, can we just make sure before we leave that uh, we do get a chance to talk about the new uh, uh, facility that um, we put in place with the local bank in Trinidad? I think that's really important for people to understand that. Yeah, absolutely, Paul. So um, I do have um, a, a couple of questions about existing production, but let, let's let's start about the new facility. This is obviously your most um, recent announcement. Why don't you um, just just walk us through that facility um, and how you deployed it and what what its significance is for the company? Why don't you? Yeah, sure, sure, Ben. So we're you know we're pretty excited about it. If you noticed in the uh, in the news release, I had a quote in there. So when I have a quote. Pretty, pretty it's a big deal. <laughs> um, it is with. Um, it hasn't closed yet, so it is an escrow, meaning everything's been signed and looking to close in a couple weeks. But uh, it's with a Trinidad-based uh, uh, bank. They're called Republic Bank Limited, biggest lender in Trinidad and the Caribbean. So we're really happy to be working with them. We're happy that they uh, you know see the opportunity to touch down, and we're happy to uh, employ local money uh, domestically on our fields. I think the big thing uh, compared to our, our current credit facility is it's U.S. dollars. That's the potential to be twenty million dollars. Um, we can draw on any increments that we choose, um, and it's also because space in Trinidad, uh, all the interest is tax deductible. So when we start getting these uh, bigger wells on stream with cash flow, um, the cost of capital really decreases from from our current uh, facility. So all those all those really you know help us and kind of move us on from the stage of uh, a develop, developing junior company to a, uh, a bigger uh, Trinidad based uh, producing company. Just touch on the covenants. Yeah, and I guess, yeah, thanks, Paul. I guess the covenants is a big thing right now. We're having, especially as I look around here in Canada, big issues with, with banks and defaults and covenants. So our first covenant test is at the uh, end of 2022. So it's really covenants testing the year for 2022. So it gives us some, some relief um, in the next couple of years, really over these last couple of months when you have negative. But uh, we don't see that uh, happening, you know, as we move forward in Q4. So it gives us some relief going forward if uh, crude oil prices remain where they are. Yeah, absolutely. And they've, also, uh, so, okay. and they've also that facility is expandable, right? Yeah, so it's one it, of the it can be syndicated as well. If, if you know we grow too big for our RBL, you know, I don't see in the near term, but hopefully that's a problem, a good problem to have. We can uh, add lenders and um, and you know use local money locally. I think. Yeah, we're really happy that they're they're interested in us for sure. Absolutely. So what I um, what I what I've read in the in the announcement is that this um, facility both helps tighten up your balance sheet and also provides you with um, well access to funding that you need to roll out your development plans with both the existing discoveries and hopefully more discoveries as we move forward. Yeah, it's just another a lever we can pull on to uh, access capital when we, we keep going forward with this uh, first these two exploration wells and then uh, whatever comes after that. But, okay. It also, really impacts, it also really impacts cost of capital. I mean, when you look at it, um, you know, our cost of capital right now is probably north of ten percent uh, with the crown facility, and you know, on an after tax basis, on an after tax basis, it's ten percent north of ten percent with crown, and on after tax basis, uh, you know, we're probably in three and a half range, three and a half to four, three and a half to four percent cost of capital, and that you know, as you get larger, um, that cost of capital is really a, a really important measure for us to, to, to keep looking at. So in that context of the company's funding, um, we've had a question, final question from Chris. And I'll tell you what, if we, if we make this our, our last question, because I know you guys do have to, to make a move. So, so Chris has asked us, are you now confident that no more equity raises are needed in the next 12 months? Yeah, uh, the answer right now with the program that we've got laid out and assuming that, you know, nothing goes sideways with uh, on the drilling front. Um, and, you know, Coho comes on stream in October when we've got you know, the models that we've got in place with, with some of the assumptions we made in the NGC pricing. Uh, and when Cascadura comes on, and, you know, if it comes on in Q2 of next year, we got a bunch of cash coming at us, um, you know, starting in that Q2 of next year. So that's exactly, in answer to his question, um, 
the three guys around this table, our number one objective right now is to manage the capital program within the funding that we have in place right now. And, um, you know, if, if you think we're being a little cagey at times, I think, you know, it, it's pretty simple. We started to drill Cascadura. I think we had a $3.8 million AFE. Uh, we got stuck in the hole. We had a major uh, breakdown on the rig. And, you know, it looks like that rig, that well cost us five and a half million bucks by the time we were done. Now, the well's worth, you know, multiple multiples of that. So the economics still go around. But I think what, what you know, Scott wants us to make sure that we do here is that, you know, we make, make the steps um, to coincide the capital program when production's coming on screen so that we don't need to raise equity and we don't want to over leverage your balance sheet. And that's the balancing act that the three of us take on every week in, in what we're doing. And, you know, COVID's pushed us out by a couple of weeks or a couple of months of coho coming on, but it's also pushed out the drilling. So, you know, those are the kind of things that we've done. And, and the base production at these current levels, uh, current levels with current pricing, basically um, will pay the bills, keeps everything going. And we can take the cash and the capital that we have right now and employ it entirely on the capital program. So, you know, that's the benefit of oil now sitting at roughly, you know, north of $35 a barrel. One other thing I did just want to say, uh, Ben, um, credit to Scott and his team is there's also these VAT refunds that we talked about, um, which will help our liquidity situation a little bit as well. We, we did receive 2.8, 2.9 million, 2.8 million USD of what they call VAT bonds which will be exchangeable for cash over the next, let's call it 90 days. So that'll also help our liquidity uh, pretty dramatically as we go forward. So I'm not trying to be cagey on the answer. I'm just uh, cautioning, cautioning everybody that the people in this room don't want to raise any more equity. And what that may mean is that we have to slow down parts of the capital program to match when cash starts coming in from Coho and Casper. Exactly. So you just have to obviously, you know, balance balance the different objectives and you know make decisions, you know, as as conditions uh, allow. That's uh, that, that's understood. So guys, we do have one very final question, and we'll, we'll, we will make this the last one to wrap things up. Um, it's a, a question from uh, Badrakhan, who's asked us. Um, we haven't really talked too much about Royston. We know obviously Royston's been pushed back, but uh, Badrakhan's asked: um, Is there still a deadline end of October on the drill licenses, um, and will you have to reapply for Royston? Um, so the, the, the planning right now is that when we took the block on, we, uh, the work commitment we did was four wells and a seismic program. Um, we arguably have tagged onto another seismic program that will at least look like we started the seismic program, but we, we still need to do the seismic at some point uh, going forward. But the four wells, um, instead of the four wells being Coho, Cascadera, Chinook, and Royston, which was the original plan, we believe the four wells now will be Coho, Chinook, Cascadera, and a second well in Cascadera. And just to caution everybody, um, because it is going deeper and targeting a, a different uh, uh, thrush sheet, it may end up with a different name. Um, just in, in that, we'll have that discussion with the Crown here as to what they want to do. But, but if they see it as a distinctly separate prospect, um, we may end up putting a different name on it. So just a, just a heads up on that. So an answer to the question is, we need four wells spotted by October. Yes, we believe we're going to meet that deadline anyway. Um, but at the same time, we're also working within the existing agreement. Now that we have a uh, defined gas um, pool, there are sort of already certain rights within the agreement uh, that we can extend the license on. So that's not anything keeping me awake at night for anybody in this room. Good. That's reassuring to hear. Well, look, Paul, James and Scott, thank you very much for your time this evening. And thanks for giving us such uh, clear and concise answers on the questions that we've been asked. Um, obviously, exciting period of news flow now coming up with um, various events happening in the company over the coming months now that, you know, we're sort of moving into the post uh, coronavirus world. And obviously, we look forward to hearing more updates from you. So thank you very much for your time this evening. Thanks, everybody.